Okay, uh, yeah, so thanks everyone um, for bearing with the situation. Um, it's great to be with you, if not in, in person, um, but I'm actually really excited to uh, continue our, our lecture from uh, last time uh, and in a more uh, stable position, as was just mentioned. Um, so uh, you re may recall, um, although uh, last uh, lecture was, uh, uh, it was taken from a position of disadvantage with me, uh, adult not only by by age but uh, also by illness. Um, uh, you know, we did uh, talk about some key elements of agent-based modeling, um, and and uh, in particular, a important thread um, in agent-based modeling, which emphasizes. Uh, simple but powerful models. Uh, models that are designed to have power precisely because of their minimalism, their simplicity, the, the, um, the austerity with which they approach the modeling allows for a real punch to be secured um, through the emergent patterns that come from the model. One can learn a lot, when just a few of the most bare, undeniable assumptions um, end up leading to inexorably certain powerful, um, uh, unexpected, and often surprising types of behavior. And uh, last time we had taken a, a look at, at some uh, models that were in that vein, the Schelling segregation model, uh, the game of life, um, but then also this uh, prisoner's dilemma model. Um, and uh, that latter model, uh, beyond having great personal significance for me, um, uh, also started to, to point towards some factors really important when we're thinking about modeling in the health space. Um, and uh, I wanted to, to review that very briefly um, for three reasons. Uh, number one, uh, uh, from my illness adult state, I don't, I don't think I communicated uh, one of the key insights that comes with that model. Um, and uh, and that insight, I think it's incumbent upon me to bequeath you that insight. Um, uh, although hopefully it won't be a final bequest on my part. Um, second of all, um, it turns out that uh, the mechanisms in that model um, for agent-agent interactions um, uh, form a foundation for two models we'll be talking about today, uh, models which focus on the issue of, of trust. Um, and thirdly, uh, because that model uh, offers us um, a, a reminder on, on how these very, very simple models can end up illuminating, pointing the way um, to to how we can use some of those types of understanding for, for thinking about um, issues uh, in uh, the broader population and society. And although uh, today we're gonna be sharpening the relevance um, uh, of, of that understanding for health by looking at this undeniably central construct of, of trust within health, um, within, uh, within that prisoner's dilemma model, we saw some, some hints of that, um, that, that were coming with the model. To, in a way, it, it presaged, it, it, it heralded um, a, a more serious engagement with this issue of trust. Um, so I'd like to, to just switch over to that, and, and I, um, wanted to situate us again in this a space of uh, stylized models. Um, 
uh, they form an important subclass of, of agent-based models. And, and they're also represented in, for example, very strongly in the system dynamics tradition, where you get a lot of minimalist, powerful models uh, that illustrate just one or two feedbacks and, and give you surprising behavior and aha insights. And agent-based modeling um, uh, is, uh, has just um, prized examples um, of those sort of models. And we noted that these sort of models serve as thinking tools, thinking prostheses. Um, uh, and uh, the stylized models help us link up very simple, often undeniable assumptions, undeniable stylized facts uh, about the world into really powerful outcomes. Um, so last time we had talked about uh, this prisoner's dilemma model and uh, we had situated individuals, oh, 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 oh. Um, okay, why that can't display, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. We had situated individuals in space, um, each uh, patch here, uh, each non-black patch is, is um, associated with a certain individual and they interact with their neighbors in the four cardinal directions and the four in between directions, northeast, southeast, southwest, south, um, and, and northwest. And each of those interactions took place in a way that reflects the, the classic prisoner's dilemma. Um, and uh, here we had two individuals who had dichotomous actions they could take. They could either cooperate or defect. And the idea is, you know, if both cooperate, um, both would be pretty well off. Um, uh, if uh, one cooperates while the other defects, um, then, uh, then the person who defects will be um, at an advantage, uh, they'll, they might get off scot-free by the prisoner analogy, whereas the one who, who's cooperating um, will end up being at a disadvantage. The numbers here, I should emphasize, indicate the outcomes for the self here. Um, so if a person cooperates and the other one ends up cooperating back, they'll, or ends up cooperating at the same time, um, this person, the self will get one. If this person defects and the other one cooperates, the other's a sucker and uh, the self, you know, uh, defects against them, um, does not cooperate. Um, the self may get off scot-free. The other one will end up uh, getting a minus two. We'll be in a situation where they cooperated, but the other defected. And finally, if both defect, they get in a really negative situation. And And much of the dilemma here had to do with the fact that um, uh, while at an individual level for any one trade, for any one transaction, interaction, it if you don't know what the other person's going to do, it seems like it's best to defect. If the other person unbeknownst to you is going to cooperate and you defect, well, you, you get two instead of the one you would have gotten if you had cooperated. If they're going to defect unbeknownst to you um, and you defect as well, you're, you're going to get dinged by minus one, but that's better than being dinged by minus two, which is what you would have gotten if you had cooperated and they, they defected. So, so it seems from a perspective of a single transaction, like it's, it's always best to defect, just shield yourself and defect. But of course, the, the, um, uh, the ironic pessimal outcome of that is that both parties will be incented to defect uh, always. And they'll end up getting a minus one where they, they could have gotten a one and both been better off. There would have been a win-win situation where both were better off, both cooperating. And instead they get in the situation where both are losing because both think, well, my short-term advantage is to defect. But the overall advantage the overall advantage, if they could um, somehow communicate, if they could you know, somehow recognize their broader self-interest will be to cooperate every time. Um, and uh, in the, prison, the iterated prisoner's dilemma, um, 
explores this issue. And, and it explores the issue, well, at a single level, the kind of narrowly construed self-interest is to the fact uh, always that that seems to gain the best. If you're going to consider many interactions with another individual, now you have to start considering not just your, the impact of your action directly at this time point, what you shield yourself from or whatever, but how the other person, how the other agent will act back, how they will respond, how they will, uh, how will they will react to your defecting against them compared to cooperating. And one of the things that's come out of experimental findings is there, it's a much more textured situation and cooperation has a much more central role to play. And Robert Axelrod and collaborators you know, ran these tournaments of different strategies, cooperating or defecting against each other. Um, and one of the biggest ones that emerged from theirs was the efficacy of tit for tat. Initially cooperate, initially give the benefit of the doubt, but thereafter reciprocate in kind. And, and that indeed can lead to situations where you can get um, uh, a stable society, as it were, not only of, of tit for tat, um, which, which will cooperate originally with itself and continue to cooperate, but even in the presence of always defect, it will fend off the always defect by pushing back against them. But if it's near always cooperate, it'll get along great. And it can allow uh, the societies to form, which have always cooperate, always defect, and perfect tit for tat, um, uh, in, in harm, living, if not in harmony, at least not living in a situation where you know, uh, the, the always defects uh, rule the day. So where most people are cooperating and always defect individuals, these predatory individuals are kept in check. They're kept from proliferating in very large numbers. And we saw last time that, you know, if you, if you go into a, a scenario like this, you see that um, always cooperate, um, uh, tit for tat, form the vast bulk of the individuals here. And there are some always defects still around, you know, parasitically sort of benefiting from their neighbors, um, uh, stealing energy as it were from their neighbors, uh, but they are fairly marginalized group. Um, tit for tat is the dominant one, but there's a role for always cooperate too. Uh, but then we saw the situation is more textured when we had uh, a low specificity tit for tat. When, when tit for tat, far from being, you know, sort of all knowing, had to deal with the possibility of misunderstandings, um, the possibility that they may misperceive another individual's actions towards them. This other individual sought to cooperate, but it came off as if they were defecting. And in that situation where we, we situate those two, uh, those, those together, always cooperate, always defect, in this imperfect tit for tat, something that aspires to tit for tat, but is imperfect information. If we go then run that, uh, we end up finding it's a, quite a lot more textured situation. Um, amongst other things, the, the imperfect information tit for tat uh, ends up occupying a much smaller fraction of the population than before, because it can get in death fights with itself due to misunderstandings, where it's a race to the bottom. They initially cooperate with each other, but eventually, inevitably, as the sun you know, follows the night, um, or as the night follows the day, um, uh, tit for tats end up being, um, uh, end up being uh, misunderstood. And once they're misunderstood, it's a very fragile situation. Once they're misunderstood, it seems like they've defected against the other imperfect for, for tat, it will defect back and defect back. And it's a race down to the bottom. So they're the imperfect tit for tat gets something like 17% and 
And always cooperate is actually dominant. And always defect is able to survive more opportunistically, eating on the fringes, taking advantage of the weakness of, of, um, uh, of imperfect tit for tat. Um, the sort of buzzards of this world or, 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 or predators of this world and, and always cooperate is, is, by, is clearly the, the dominant um, strategy, but in a world where tit for tat, uh, because of its fragility, has been more marginalized. Um, now, this, uh, this strategy can lead to imperfect tit for tat by itself disappearing, in fact. Um, but all of this, all of this, ladies and gentlemen, um, is, is pointing us to a certain concept, a certain concept that, that isn't reified in this model. It isn't given a name and represented. We don't attempt to, to characterize it explicitly, but it's in the background. And what is that concept? It's the concept in a word of trust. It's a concept uh, that is of central interest here because it's, it's in the context of uh, interactions between individuals that they make their decisions. It's based on their past experience with another individual, a neighboring tit for tat that, or a neighboring always defect, that they're, they're shaping their decisions about the future as well. Um, my choices are dependent on how you've acted towards me, how you treated me. And we could be apologized for saying that at some level, it's associated with, with a feeling of, of trust and that trust can be violated. So if A cooperates, you know, in a, in a, vicious, in a virtuous cycle form of this, if A cooperates, with, with another neighbor B, so we have agent A and they cooperate with the neighbor B, B's trust in A may grow. Um, and as a result of that, B may be more likely, think tit for tat, for example, um, to cooperate. Uh, and as a result of cooperation, um, I could probably put in a cooperation um, a node here, A's trust in B, as a result of the cooperation by B back, the good treatment by B, A's trust in B rises. And that means that it's more likely that A will cooperate. Of course, this isn't true for always defect. Always defect breaks this cycle, right? Um, um, no matter how much B is trusted in A, B says, I'm going to screw you over. I'm going to take advantage of you. If A is cooperated with, then B will say, "You're a sucker. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, um, get my rightful due." Uh, but with many strategies, this vicious cycle, uh, this virtuous cycle, is operating. Um, but what we saw is that when you have a virtuous cycle like this, um, it's based on reinforcing feedback. This is, of course, central to my my teaching on system dynamics uh, for those interested, the course I teach in, in second term um, uh, involving three types of modeling and system dynamics is given uh, a good 40% or so of the course. Uh, and, and one of the things you realize is a cycle like this uh, is a reinforcing feedback. You kind of multiply these positives according to the rule of sign. And, and so a change in, an increase in cooperation by A will ripple around and tend to increase that further push in the same direction as that original change, further amplify it. Just like, you know, saying something into a mic that as a speaker too close by connected to it will lead to a, a positive squeeze feedback, which will lead, lead the system to squeal in a most um, unpleasant fashion. Um, in a fashion most unpleasant. Um, now, these sort of reinforcing feedbacks um, tend to amplify a change in a certain direction. That's why they're called positive feedbacks, not out of a normative sense, but because they amplify it. They turn that little sound into a high, high volume squeal. Um, 
And the same thing holds regardless of the direction of the original change. So if instead of this originally going up and went down, if A does not cooperate, think imperfect tit for tat when it misunderstands the actions of the other. It, 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 it does not cooperate. That leads to B's trust in A being violated. Think a neighboring imperfect tit for tat. The neighbor tried to cooperate. You misunderstood it as, as defecting. You defect back and their trust in you goes down. Their likelihood of cooperating with you is shot. And as a result, they don't cooperate with you and your trust in them is even worsened. And that leads to less cooperation by you. And it's the race to the bottom that I talk about that leads, in fact, to, you know, the eventual disappearance of imperfect tit for tat, the strategy which could be so successful, but is fragile under misunderstandings, absent any sort of mechanism for forgiveness. So here, you could say that there's a construct of trust in the background, a tacit concept, but it hasn't been reified. And today, ladies and gentlemen, I wanna look at two models, which have taken the step of reifying. And I'm pleased to be associated with two models. They're not the only models we've built with a centrality of trust. There's some other models, less stylized, more empirically grounded and rich, where trust plays a central role. And then there are some where it is pretty stylized and we're dealing with that in a very particular context, say of, of, of substance use and, and stigmatization associated with, with substance use and mental health challenges. But I've chosen these because of their power and simplicity, their power in, in simplicity. And here we have reified the concept of trust. Okay, um, so um, in order to sort of motivate this, I want to, uh, to, to mention some stylized facts about trust, um, uh, some almost undeniable facts. And I mentioned them last time, so I won't go through them exhaustively, but it's relational character, you have trust in a certain party often. Uh, you have trust in a certain institution or a certain particular person, for example. It's memory fault. It has some memory associated with it. Uh, it can change, be built up continuously, or, or it can be lost in a, in a flash. Um, it's asymmetric. It often takes more time to build up than it does to lose it. Um, it's affected by the flow of information. It's transitive if A trusts B and B trusts C. A tends to trust C more. Um, uh, and uh, there's often commutivity involved. If A trusts B, B is more likely to be open in their heart to A and, and more likely to trust them. And it it's shaped by people's networks of connections. Um, and uh, Often, uh, the people we trust are the ones that we listen to and might use to, to shape, our, shape our behavior. Okay, um, so I've provided you the two models that I'm going to be uh, talking about today. The first is something called Trust Network Group Effect Study <laughs> Accounting Groups in Big Ints version three. The truth is I'm not gonna make heavy use of the model um, um, unlike last time, um, but you're welcome to load it if you wanna sort of you know, prowl around it and see some features. And what this model, this first model involving trust uh, examines is um, uh, a collection of an important subset of these um, stylized facts, um, these sort of undeniable truths. Um, that we hold to be self-evident, um, which are, are shown in red. Um, okay, um, so um, in this model, you will find within an agent, um, a very simple, austere, 
minimalist characterization of behavior and characteristics. Each agent has lent an ID. Um, uh, they're lent a, a certain uh, coefficient, which indicates how much they trust their own experience compared to the experience of others, um, uh, others within their trust network um, and within their group. Um, and they have a certain amount of, of wealth. It turns out wealth doesn't, like uh, wealth could be analogized to energy and the prisoner's dilemma model. It turns out it, it doesn't um, uh, have a central impact in terms of the agent dying. But what is kept track of is their, um, their trust with respect to a certain person. And you could think of that as a, as a um, account, as it were. And uh, if a person is, uh, has their trust built up, um, uh, that account will be accrued. If uh, the person's trust is violated, um, the trust level for that with respect to that person will be lowered. And they're either in a state of kind of engaging in a transaction with someone or waiting between trades. And this is in continuous time, as you can see from that, that, um, uh, that uh, hazard rate. Um, okay, so in brief, there's a hundred agents and they either cooperate or compete, or you could say cooperate or defect. Um, very much along the lines of the iterated prisoner's dilemma that we saw last time uh, in my opening remarks. But there's some really big differences um, as well. Agent behaviors here are stochastic. This is a model in continuous time, not discrete time. Uh, but more deeply, the behaviors are not fixed. They are stochastic. And um, we're not, in this model, we're not examining the effects of different strategies, you know, tit for tat, always cooperate, always defect. No, no, no. Really, our focus is on kind of one strategy, which is, as it says, a modified tit for tat strategy. The idea here is that you have a certain trustworthiness score that you assign for another agent. Um, so maybe you're a given agent, if you start off, you have a trustworthiness score of 60%. So you're 60% likely to cooperate with that agent if you don't know them from E. Um, but uh, by contrast, if there's someone you've dealt with a lot before and you have a very good longstanding relationship with them, um, uh, that's built up a lot of trust, you're 100% likely to cooperate with them. By contrast, if you've dealt with them and they're kind of a, you feel they're a shady character and you have only have a trust score of minus 60, you know, you're somewhere north of a uh, point of 20% likely to cooperate. So each time you're flipping a coin and this gives your chance of, 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 of flipping heads, um, but uh, here, um, it depends on your history with the person, not on a particular trait. It's more your, your, your history with them, okay? So each person, say person two here, has a debit account, as it were, of trust, trustworthiness with respect to each other person, not with respect to themselves, that's not really meaningful, but with respect to person one, they view them as, as, as uh, trustworthiness five, somewhere in here. So they'd have something like a 62% chance of cooperating with them. Person three, uh, they're a mensch. You know, they're, they'll, they'll, they'll cooperate with uh, 60, 65%. They're, they're, they're better yet. Person four, uh, they don't like dealing with them, minus 40. So it's something like a 37% chance of cooperating with them. Um, and, and, you know, some people they might not have dealt with before and they might have a trustworthiness score of zero. So each person, remember trust is relational. 
each person with respect to every other of those, every other 99 of the 99 people, every other of the 100 people, that is the other 99 people, they have a trustworthiness score for them. By the way, this will end up applying to the next model too. So bears, bears real note here. And it's stochastic, right? They, based on this trustworthiness score, they have a probability of cooperating with them. And depending on what they roll on the, on the uh, coin, you know, roll on the coin, what they flip on the coin, um, they'll either uh, cooperate or not with them. Okay. Um, uh, and uh, transactions here only impact trust. We're not keeping track of energy. We're not keeping track of deaths because they're unsuccessful as a trader. This is, you know, think about business transactions or something like that. Um, and agents trade repeatedly. Uh, they have an average of one transaction per time unit, hence, hence this kind of uh, time out there, okay? Um, and it's asynchronous, so, so they do it at different times. Um, now, each transaction updates the trust behavior, but it updates it in a different way reflective of the, uh, of the stylized facts I mentioned. I mentioned the stylized facts. So one of them is this asymmetry that often it takes more time to build up trust than it does to lose it. Um, and, and so if a partner cooperates, we treat the trust as rising by 10 points. Their trustworthiness, if it was 20, if it were 20, it goes up to, to 30. If it were 30, it went up, goes up to 40. If it's 140, well, it can't go up anymore and it just maxes out there that way. Actually, I think it may be that 100 is the max. I think it, 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 I think it just if it's above 100, it doesn't, doesn't go up. Um, if the partner competes, in other words, if they defect against me, my trust goes down by 15, okay? Um, okay, now, this model gives rise to emergent behavior. Um, if agents only consider their self history. They only consider my experience with this other person, you know, person two's experience with person one. They reflect back on it and make the decision. Their experience with person four, experience with person three. Well, what happens um, might be something you predict, and it reflects this cycle. Either they get on because of the vagaries of those initial interactions, they're positive interactions, positive breed, positive interactions breed positive increases in trust, breeds greater likelihood of cooperating, breeds greater trust, and greater cooperation yet. I see my internet is, is uh, experiencing um, uh, some sort of distress, and uh, I wish I had an easy remedy for it. But um, if it continues to be a problem, let me know, and I will. I will go get another, another uh, uh, connector. Oh, here it is. Okay, I'll I'll plug it in right now. Uh, great. Okay. Um, so what I was saying is this: this image, the fact that it's all black and white, reflects two things. One is some initial positive interactions that breed more positive interactions, breed more positive, or you can guess where the other is going. Negative interactions that breed negative history that brings more likelihood of negative interactions. In other words, defecting on my part, defecting on your part back, defecting on my part, your part, and a race to the problem, bottom. And so what that leads to is interactions that either lead to very positive relationships that are stable and positive, where, you know, the occasional trust breaking, you know, uh, does, you know, it, it, it lowers it a bit, it, it takes it from 100 to, to 90. Um, so they, they violated my trust, my trust and then goes down from 100 to 90, but I'm still 90% likely to cooperate with them and, 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 you know, interact positively with them, further my trust score with them, and they're likely to reciprocate. And 
And so it'll tend to to kind of be self-limiting and it will tend to, to come back. Um, okay, um, that's the idea at least. Um, and, uh, and yet you can also have some that are very negative or where they have a, they're off to a bad start and they get, get worse and worse and it, it um, and races to the bottom. Um, and I'd have to double check, but um, there may actually be a bit of a buffer zone here, which means I was wrong that it bounces back. Actually, it could race down, but you 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 may have a bit of leeway here with um, no loss of likelihood of cooperating for the first little bit. In any case, this is totally. You may notice that this is symmetric. These three here are matched by these three. This dot here is matched by that dot. Everything is bilaterally symmetric in a way that would make a, a student of chordate anatomy proud. Um, and uh, uh, here, you know, A interacts with B, so B interacts with A. They tend to go together. It's a positive relationship or it's a negative relationship for both. Again, true to our notions of how these things work in the world, right? Um, uh, it's hard to have one person say it's a great relationship with this other person and the other person say, no, it's horrible. I guess you get that with psychopaths or something. Okay. Um, now, the interesting thing is that this model considered, and I should have a slide on this, what would be the effect now if instead of people just trusting their own judgments, they, they use group judgments. So they listen to the people that they most trust right now, right now, um, what they think about another person, and they consider that. And there's a, there's a spectrum between them. Either they could rely entirely on their self-history, which is what this is, their direct experience, personal experience, lived experience, or they could rely on the experience of others who they trust entirely and and uh, take their opinions of this other person. And because trust is relational, um, this other person they trust here um, in this model, it, you know, I may love dealing with person B, but person C, who I really trust as well, um, has a very bad relationship with B. And if you, if you just take group history, it turns out it's terribly unstable. It, it turns out that who I trust changes over time. Therefore, who I listen to changes over time. There's no bearing on who they trust and who I trust. And so my sense of who I trust is, is just shifting around. It's entropically evolving in this sort of miasma over time, only considering group history um, of people I trust. And when I stop trusting that person, I stop listening to them. And it turns out there's no, there's no particular rhyme or reason for, for me trusting this person versus that one. And it turns into this kind of soup of, of um, you know, shifting alliances and shifting um, preferences, um, uh, whims, one might say, within the populace. Um, now, where it gets really interesting is when you mix some people who have group history, they listen to others who they trust to form their judgment. Um, they listen only to them. Um, whereas another group, so this is the group history. The other group is they listen only to themselves. What's notable here to explain this result, this is entropic. It's just shifting around. And at any one point, it will look kind of like this, but it will shift and shift and shift. By contrast, this may look random, but it's stable. Once I get caught into a relationship with someone, it's either very positive this cycle has worked as a virtuous cycle, or it's very negative. This cycle has worked as a vicious cycle. It's been a race to the bottom. Distrust on both sides leads to, 
to uh, adverse behavior, agonistic interactions, and a lack of trust. And so this is stable. And it turns out the group, the group that listened to themselves, that listened to others they perfectly trust, they have some relationships with these folks. And these folks have very stable judgments. And these folks, based on their own experience, these folks are listening to a bunch of others, including some up here, just listening to others, not making their own judgments, just what, what are people saying? What do you hear on the street? But then they're also listening to some of these who make their own judgments and stick by these judgments, better or for worse. These, these very, you know, set judgments after a little bit. And so these actually reflect the cross interactions between them of, of uh, some of these, these individuals kind of anchoring and relationships of high trust with some of these and listening to them. And that lends stability. It actually lends great stability. And what happens is that this group, this group component, they end up listening to these folks and end up um, having a surprisingly high trust level. But this is just one of several possible outcomes. I, I, I want you to pay attention to what can happen. Here, they're all one big block. Not the block Quebecois, but but uh, another type of block. Uh, they're a big block of of, of solid trust. Mm. Um, uh, they have they're very very high high um, uh, high levels associated with them, um, uh, which are are characterizing their trust of this person with respect to all these others in the group. Um. But it turns out that um, that if you have even a very small fraction of this population being these folks who trust their own experience, they trust their own past judgment, um, uh, past experience with someone, their lived experience, and they rely on that for making their decisions um, with no forgiveness, unfortunately, but but making their decisions. They have a very strong, you know, uh, uh, relationship with some, and a very poor and defect, defectful relationship with others. Even if it's only five percent of the population, it turns out they stabilize the rest of the population. Um, this is five percent of the population is these selfers, these these folks who listen to their own experience. Groupers here, which are 95% of the population, um, are stabilized by virtue of interacting with these folks. And then they end up um, forming their own stable opinions of others. But here, here they were in one clique. They were in one big group. Here they're in two cliques. Um, it turns out, you can't see this, but it turns out that if you really analyze this, there's two groups here. One group of, of groupers that trust each other um, and a disjoint group, a group that's totally separate, trusting each other. Um, and it turns out this is a stochastic pattern um, that results. And, and uh, the various experiments that uh, Kurt and Ansgar and I think myself, um, well, certainly those two took the lead on running them. There are one to four groups formed. So in other words, there was stability brought by even a small fraction, a tiny fraction of the population being these folks who trust their own experience. It led stability to the rest of the population, but it wasn't always one group like here. It, it was by chance. It could be two groups, three groups, four groups um, um, in, in these sort of cliques where they trust themselves within their group, but not other people. Um, so this was kind of an intriguing thing. And I, I want to highlight you know, one of these principles that comes out of complexity science and is manifested in age-based models, which is heterogeneity matters. And even a small fraction of the population can be the tail that wags the dog. It, even a small, small fraction of the population can end up changing the situation for the rest dramatically just like a small core group with really dense network connections for STIs, sexually transmitted infections like gonorrhea, chlamydia, HPV, or what have you, can 
keep these these infections alive in the population in a way that you would never think if you looked at the population averages of contacts, you would think we'll go extinct. Um, now, uh, it turns out that the self-ratio, we, we were looking there at two extremes, groupers and selfers, people who listen only to their own lived experience or only to others. But it turns out if you have the entire population divided into two groups, um, but they all share the same self-ratio, they, they all share the same amount, how much they trust their own judgment versus judge how much they take their judgment from listening to others. Um, we can tune that parameter between zero and one. And it turns out if it's, um, at one, you get higher trust levels established. So it turns out that if, if you have um, people listening to our lived experience, there's a lot of adverse relationships that result, a lot of missed opportunities for relationships because of you know, a lack of forgiveness and a race to the bottom with this vicious cycle. Um, but there's a pretty high level of trust that, that develops on average. By contrast, if you have lower values, if, if it's listening to others and to those you trust to sort of make, make your judgment and it's shifting who you trust over time based on that, turns out that, that the trust levels that result in the whole population are, 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 are low. Um, uh, and... Um, interestingly, though, there are these critical points where, for whatever reason, um, you get high le higher levels of trust, even though you're listening mostly, mostly to, to what others are saying. Um, we're not quite sure why that is. Um, uh, but it's reflected as well in fragmentation. It turns out if you have very high levels of trust of your own judgment, very high levels of, of trust of your own lived experience and trust. Um, it does breed somewhat more trust um, on average if people are going by that, but it also breeds a lot of fragmentation. You get this whole crazy quilt of people trusting each other or not. And, and it's, it's just, there's really little, you know, big structure there. Um, uh, there's many, many fragments, it's fragmented into many sort of cliques and, and so on. But it turns out as you lower the self-ratio, you get um, uh, part way, uh, you get uh, a case of lower fragmentation. And at this kind of critical point where it's most of the way to listen to others, but you're still trusting your judgment enough that it leads to big behaviors. People are still weighing their own lived experience. You have comparatively few components. You get things like this, where you have, you know, or, or like this, where you have just a small number of cliques of, of people born in and comparatively high levels of trust. But then as you low it all the way yet, to just listen to others, once again, it's fragmented and entropic and just sort of blinking and changing over time with not a lot of structure. Um, uh, by the way, this so this in short leads to greater stability. This is up here, it's stable. It's stable here, stable high trust. That's what this situation is here. But if you have no listening to your own experience, it, it's unstable, it's, it, it's entropic, it keeps on shifting around uh, over time and, and it's low trust <laughs> to boot. Um, this is comparatively high trust, very stable. This is, um, is less stable, but it, it's comparatively higher trust and it's in fewer components, less cliqueiness from them. So this is, Kind of food for thought, uh, you know, in a world where we're listening so much for cues on who to trust, 
and by extension, what actions to take um, secondary to that by listening to what other people are saying, um, you know, that you, you, you might be excused for thinking, well, maybe that's, maybe that's a positive thing. We're listening to many voices. Um, uh, but at the same time, what this is suggesting is if you just put aside your personal experience, your lived experience, um, and you putting your trust of who to trust, on the people you trust right now, you can be a little bit like a tag chasing its tail or a dog chasing its tag, a dog chasing its tail. And it sort of circles around and it it leads to this very un, unstable behavior. Um, so there's a lot more to be done about this. This is a preliminary model. I think it was published around 2014, uh, 2015. A um, lot more to be done around that, but I. I want to show you one thing we did do around it, which I think is more um, significant in its implications yet. So this was a troubling set of findings that came out of this in many ways. Um, and it took some of the core ideas from Prisoner's Dilemma and from this last um uh this last uh, study we just looked at and built on them um to look at a troubling psychological phenomenon um so this model ends up taking all those subset of components that we looked at as before but but it adds one more this observation which seems pretty undeniable that our trust of a of a given person or a given institution can be shaped by your experience with others like, like them. And I put like in scare quotes because often that's a real judgment. What, what's shaping that may not be things that are, are really of, of, of strong significance, but maybe things that are superficial, but, but obvious visually, skin color, the language they speak, um, hair color, um, their age, their gender, what have you. Um, we may draw experiences on experiences with others with similar visible characteristics as them, use that to shape our trust levels with respect to a new person we've met. and. And we put them in the same category. So this is about heterogeneity. It's about people of, of different types. Um, and no, if Maurice is wondering, these are not the Dorper and Merino sheep from Mark Heffernan's farm, um, uh, which I recall were, um, were all more looking uh, like this color. Um, so, so the idea here is you know, a given person is in a certain group. And um, maybe they are female, for example, or maybe they are male, or maybe they are, you know, born in Canada um, uh, or what have you. And then there's an outgroup. So if this person was male, maybe this outgroup is females. Um, and, and maybe they encounter someone for the first time um, in that group. And the idea of outgroup homogeneity is that, um, you know these these two groups are are different, but um, you know if if we're uh, a female, for example, we may view males as being kind of a lot more similar than we view females as. Or if we're male, we see males as being quite different from each other in their attitudes and their habits and their preferences and their character and et cetera. But when it comes to women, well, you know maybe we we view them as kind of um, somewhat different, but it, but broadly um, a lot more similar than men are or something like that. That's that's the idea, like this this idea of outgroup homogeneity. It's the tendency to view members of, of these other groups as more similar or more homogenous than members of the groups we identify, um, with which we identify, right? Um, so, we want to probe the significance of this 
when put into the type of model that we just looked at, where we have groups and we have trust and we have interactions that can be positive or, or negative uh, in character and where we keep a sense of trust score, but where we may weigh our experiences not only from our direct observation with one person, but from uh, from our uh, our considerations from other areas as well. In this case, considering our interactions with other people like them, um, in in some superficial way. So, after having seen the prisoner's dilemma model, iterated prisoner's dilemma in two D space, and having seen this last model uh, involving um, trust and 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 groups and sort of selfers groupers, um, this will be very familiar. We we have a choice: cooperate or defect, or cooperate or compete, if you want to call it that way. Um, and like the last model, agents cooperate when they expect the other person to cooperate as well, right? Um, and there's this construct explicitly reified, explicitly represented in the model of trust, um, trustworthiness. And agents trade repeatedly. Um, so there, again, there's this perceived trustworthiness. And it's the same curve. It's the same old stinking curve that we had last time. So absent experience of myself with this person before, um, uh, I will have a certain probability. So if I have no information about this person, I will have a probability of 60% chance of cooperating with them. Um, and I flip a coin. Um, if this is someone that I trust a great deal, I will be perfectly likely to cooperate with them. If it's someone that I distrust a great deal, I'd be, I will definitely defect against them. I won't cooperate with them. Um, uh, and the agents uh, trade repeatedly, and that ends up accruing our perceived trustworthiness. So just like before, each agent has a balance of trustworthiness, a kind of a score they've kept with respect to others. And that score could be accrued um, if they have, um, uh, you know, if the, if, if, the um, if it's a positive trade, uh, the score will rise from 10 to 20, if the transaction was favorable, it'll go up from 10 to 20 person's attitude with respect to person five after a, if person five has cooperated back with them, this will go from 10 to 20, it will increase their trustworthiness. By contrast, if that person defected against them, it would go from 10 to minus five. Mm. Um, and uh, that will, their updated trustworthiness with respect to that other person would then would then lead them to shift how they interact with that person the next time. Okay, um, so that's the basic idea. And I'm presenting that with a particular nod to the idea of judging it on your own experience. As we'll see, there's a more, um, there's a nuance here um, with respect to something other than their experience with that agent that comes in. So um, uh, here we have, again, 100 agents. Again, they make transactions one time unit before starting a trade. And cooperation is likelier if, if an agent trusts another agent, right? Um, now, here's the new component. Um, till now, you could be excused for saying, well, wait a minute, this is the same thing we saw before. Well. Um, Okay, we're going to have now self perception and then a group perception, but but it's not the same as as the listening to other people we trust. No, 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 no. That we had before. No, this is a different one, even if the the term, the symbols are similar. Here, group perception will be it's going to reflect this outgroup homogeneity construct. This idea that you know, if I see someone, um, if I'm born in Canada and I meet someone born outside of Canada, I 
I may say, well, I haven't dealt with this person before, but I've dealt with a lot of people like them, like them, dealt with a lot of those other foreigners. So I'm going to consider my trust with respect to all those foreigners I've dealt with. And that is what I'm going to consider um, for this person. That would be the group perception, pure group perception. I wouldn't look at all for what my experience is with just with respect to them. I would consider my experience with all people like them. Of course, all my experiences with people like them, I'll consider that. That would be group perception. And there's this group salience that that shifts us between relying entirely on our our lived experience perception or entirely on our group perception. So if uh, this is a very common formulation, you'll notice this is one minus alpha, this is alpha, i oh, sorry, one minus sigma, this is sigma. If you total them up, they're one. This is very common. You have one minus uh, this times this thing plus this times that. So it gives kind of a weighted average in short. So if sigma is zero, um, that would mean zero times this, this goes away. And you basically have one minus zero, one times this. And it's, they're basing it entirely on their own perception, their own lived experience with a person A with respect to B to judge their trustworthiness. By contrast, if sigma is one, this will be one times this will be one minus one. So this will be zero. So this will go away. This whole term will go away in its impact. And you'll just be making your judgment. Person A will be making their judgment with respect to the trustworthiness of person B based only on the average of all the trustworthiness that they've accrued with respect to other people like them. In other words, it'll be like maybe they're dealing with person five and people four five and eight are just like people, person five. So four, five, and eight, if two is going to decide, what are they going to do with person five? Well, you know, they're a foreigner or they're a, a, a you know, a, a, a woman or they're a, they're a um, low income person or whatever. Um, uh, I'm going to take, to judge, get the trustworthiness, I'll take the average of three Oh, sorry, minus 30, 10, and 50, right? So if you add those up, you get 30, right? So minus 30 plus 10 is minus 20 plus 50 is, is 30. Um, and we'll divide by three and we'll get 10, which happens actually in this case to be the same as, as this score. Um, but in general, it could be quite different, right? Um, and I will use that then to look up and figure out my probability of cooperating with them or not. So, so if sigma is one, I'm making it entirely on my trustworthiness with respect to people like them. So how does this affect the dynamics of the model? Well, we, we know what it is if sigma is zero because that's what we ran in the last model, right? You should recognize this. Um, it's it's the same basic thing um, as we saw last time. Um, so we ran these for 500,000 time steps and 20, well, it turns out 20 replications. We'll, we'll come to that. But this is the same thing. This is for without outgroup uh, uh, homogeneity. In other words, we just have sigma being zero. Um, and so we're only considering, so one minus zero or, or one times this. So we're only considering our, our lived experience, not at all considering this. That's what it gives you. And we have, but we have people, group A, group B, they're no different. They're no different. There's no difference between them in terms of any mechanics of the situation, in terms of their parameters or behavior. We're just dividing them into this, this group. These are, say, men and women, or these are those born inside Canada or those born outside, or these are you know, uh, and people, uh, people who are poor and these are people who are rich or whatever it is, um, two different groups. And you'll notice here, they're purely basing uh, their own experience. They're not lumping people together. And so they're just as likely to 
you know, um, have a favorable trust score for someone in their group as another group. It, it doesn't matter. They're blind to these differences and, and uh, they are they are dealing with each other in a sort of comparable way. Okay, now how if we have outgroup um, uh, homogeneity? So here we had group salience or as, as zero. So it was entirely this, a sigma equal equals zero. That's called group salience, okay? If it's 0.5, okay, um, now we're having people in group A, um, uh, they are, they are considering, um, and, and I should have emphasized here, this group judgment only comes in when you're considering the person in the other group. I should have emphasized that earlier. Not your own group. If it's your own group, you're just using their personal experience. That's the whole idea of, you know, this male saying, ah, oh, women are, are kind of similar. So their own group, they judge them on their personal experience. Oh, that's just Dave. That's just Dave. He's he's being Dave. Um, whereas if they're dealing with women, maybe they think, well, they're, you know, cozy pan tutti, as, as Mozart um, you know, opera would say. Um, they think they're all like that. Um, um, so if you have outgroup homogeneity here, group A, you know, with respect to Ed, well, they're just dealing with Dave and Sam and Joe and, and Dan or whatever. Um, but when it comes to group B, bad news, ladies and gentlemen, bad news in the worst type. Now they're using their judgments, not of that person, but of others like them, others in group B. Well, everyone they dealt with in group B. And guess what? Not everyone in group B is a saint. Not everyone in group B they've had a positive relationship with. But that drags down their relationship with others um, who are, who would be willing to be in a good relationship with them. It makes them be more guarded with them. It makes them less likely to cooperate with them. It makes them more likely to defect against them, which breeds defections back, which breeds defections back. And it's a race to the bottom, ladies and gentlemen. Their clumping everyone in group B leads them to, to short circuit, to, to short change the ability to build positive relationships with group B. And it leads to a race to the bottom where they're more guarded, they defect against them, and there's defects on both sides that are end up coming about, and they end up having a lousy relationship with them. Um, and uh, and so for group A's relationships with the other A's where they view them as individuals and judge it based on their lived experience with that individual is, you know, it's on average, it's not great, but it's on average a lot better than dealing with B. And similarly, B uh, dealing with people in group A is negative, um, uh, consistently negative, whereas within their own group, they're, you know, they, they have some positive, some negative, but on average, it's, it's better than that. And this is the this is part of the difficult facts of this situation. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, over time, so the x-axis is time here. The y-axis is the fraction of relationships between groups. So that is relationships of like A to B or B to A that have trust greater than zero. Um, starts off with, um, in, a, in a favorable way, um, but, well, it starts off at least around 0.4 or something. Um, and, and then after that, it will decline depending on this group salience value. So um, it may decline more as group salience goes up. In other words, as people 
for people in the other group as they trust more their clumped impression of people in that other group as they lump them together and say oh they're like that um you know i better be more careful that will tend if at the larger and larger sigma is the faster and faster uh this will uh th this will end up uh declining here um and and so you could see 0.5 it goes down really quickly if they're heavily judging that's what this one is here um heavily judging them within the first it looks like 10 time units um 10 units of time basically it's gone to almost zero um in other words there are very few cross group relationships that are positive um 0.45 it's a bit less bad with 0.4 it's less it's it, it goes less quickly to zero but it's still going down and really it takes very small levels um things like 0 0.2 0 0.15 0 0.1 to really um uh you know get it from tanking very very quickly so this is very troubling um it's easy for people to latch on to inessential characteristics, to read a book, despite the idiom, despite the adage, by its color cover, and to latch on to superficial, incidental physical characteristics, skin color, accent, language, country of origin, immigration status, socioeconomic status, education level, what have you, um, to, to latch on to those as sort of a defining characteristic of the person. And gender and, and sex, of course, occur there. And by virtue of that, it can short change, it can undercut and short circuit the ability to build relationships of trust, leads to more guarded behavior that leads to this sort of vicious uh vicious cycle potentially kicking in a cycle where guardedness on one part leads to guardedness on the other and if it doesn't go to outright acrimony at least it prevents a close relationship from forming and it keeps the potential of that relationship from being realized um uh so this this feedback lies behind these results in big ways, right? It, it it leads to these races to the bottom shown and these kind of you know stark differences between bright bright colors and dark colors here. Um, and that's what we see here. We see, you know, this the psychological tendency to clump people leads to these um, troubling uh, uh, troubling tendencies to short change relationships and thereby to um, um, to undercut you know the, the 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 real potential and undercut the human condition by by leading people to erect barriers and be more guarded where they don't have to be and potentially mistreat others um out of defensiveness where they don't have to um and to you know, decrease opportunities for prosperity and 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 flourishing. So, um, you know, this these are very simple models. These are models with you know very very simple characteristics, but they're food for thought, right? And 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 they make you think about what are the effects of clumping people, for example. Um, how does that affect the psyche? How does it affect impressions? How does it affect behavior? How does it affect reciprocal behavior, um, perceptions on the other sides? You know, here we are able to observe how how this outgroup homogeneity affects trust development, um, um, and you know, examine the effects of changing the the strength of that effect. Um, something which might be changed in some way by uh, education efforts, by diversity. Um, inclusion efforts, um, having people grow up in an environment or, or be educated in an environment, which is diverse, 
and where you see uh, these people may look look differently than me, but they're all very they're very different from each other. They're they're as different as I am from others who look to them like me. Um, <coughs> Um, and to observe this longitudinal effects of, of nonlinearity at several levels um, uh, and the effects of these, these driving feedbacks. Um, obviously, a model like this is, um, has very, very simplifying assumptions. That's the nature of stylized models. Um, and you know, one has to be very cautious about running out and um, assuming that it applies um, in full force to any social surrounds. But you know, models like this make you make you think, okay, um, maybe it is true that these effects um, don't yield such stark outcomes in the world, but are there whispers of those outcomes? Are there hints of them? Um, if we don't see this, what is it about human psychology, sociology um, that limits this effect? It makes you start to think about those factors. And, and those are constructive questions because they might lead you to elaborate a more convincing theory of, of trust, um, a, a more convincing theory that, that you know, explicates additional additional um, textures of the undeniable situation. So we've looked in these two lectures at theory building models, these caricature models, which are powerful precisely because they are simple, because they are stylized. They're like these political cartoons that by exaggerating some feature of the situation may point to an underlying truth. Um, and they, they can work to sharpen our thinking not because they exactly represent the world, but if their messages are powerful enough, and I think that last one is, it should cause us, it should give us pause to think and reflect on the, the more textured situation in the world and, and ask, what are we missing that may be there in the world? Um, or to what degree are we seeing aspects of this, but are they limited by some other factors? And if so, what might those be? And those can help us, you know, build theory, um, build up our, our, our understanding of what it would take for a more full accounting um, of, of uh, you know, ideas of trust. But I want to come back to this set of stylized facts also. Um, you know, we tapped here um, a subset in, in each model. We tapped a subset of these. And, you know, again, I want to make the plug that um, whatever you think about these particular models, whatever their shortcomings and limitations, which are manifold, uh, you know, there's, it's incumbent, I think, on us as modelers to recognize um, that there are features of the human condition that are such central, such centrality in, in the human sphere that um, we, we, we owe them our due to think about representing them at some level. And in many of these cases, we don't have, you know, a defined scientifically established uh, canonical way to represent them or a, a really firm, firm, firm idea of how their dynamics work. But I hope these models and some of those last time have made you think about, you know, ways that you can creatively put together some basic features of a situation into a model, not in a privileged way, but in a way that is plausible, at least, to get you thinking about how these things might interact. And of course, there's nothing to prevent us creating an alternative model of trust, which maybe shares most of these features, but, but approaches it in a different angle. And, and that can just enrich the conversation. Um, but often we do have these facts. And remember, I, I lar long argued to you um, 
some from this very seat, that models are about a lot more than data. They capture structure um, and they capture, you know, um, these, this orderliness, this regularity of, of, of features in the world. And this is an area where we can list out um, characteristics and have our models uh, accord with them, um, consistent with them in ways that can give really good insight. And, and a model like that, even though it doesn't have data per se about one community or another, I think it's contributed something and it's contributed to our thinking. Um, Jay Forrester, the uh, um, premier uh, pioneer system dynamics, uh, a cyberneticist um, of note, an inventor of core memory and a, a towering figure in, in early computation, um, uh, who went on to develop this uh, field of system dynamics, which became increasingly broadly uh, applied in um, societal context, once argued also invade against the uh, abiding by the, the curse of Procrustes, whereby we, we truncate um, inconvenient parts of a situation in the world just because we don't know how to characterize it. And he argued that, you know, if there's a factor in your model that you know is important in the world, you know it's a shaping factor. And you shrug your shoulders and say, well, look, I don't know how to represent this. So I'm going to leave it out at the model. Um, what he said, and and I think there's something to be learned from it, although I think it's a bit clip, is that you're assigning it the very value you know it doesn't have. Maybe you don't know how it will impact things. Maybe you don't know if it has positive impact or negative impact even. But the one value you know it doesn't have from your direct experience and observations of the situation is value of zero, which is no impact. And if you're cutting it out altogether, he argued you're, you're, you're recording it, the one value you know it doesn't have. Now, the truth is, I think, you know, the, in, one has to remember, all models have scopes. And models can be very powerful when they leave things out that are out of scope consciously and with that as a stated limitation. And you, um, you build on what is in the model to learn from it. Um, and it's not to say we shouldn't have model scopes, which omit factors. Of course, we need them to omit factors, you know, when we do routinely. And, and that's, uh, in many ways, one of the key ingredients for making progress in modeling. But it is true that we shouldn't forever rule out things like trust, respect, stigma, issues having to do with, um, you know, key um, human factors, uh, you know, prejudice out of our models just because we feel, well, the evidence isn't there yet to assign them a number or the theory is not yet developed. We need modeling that's more open to trying out um, learning. And that's what stylized models are. That's what these caricature models, that's how they, they fit in there. They can really contribute to our knowledge without trying to claim that they're the you know, comprehensive uh, view of, of this situation. One other factor, as we'll see when we discuss calibration shortly, you know, often when you leave a factor out of a model um, and you calibrate it to data, the effects of that factor end up getting incorporated in the effects of other factors in the model. And so the fact you calibrate it to this data absent that factor means the impacts of that factor are kind of being distributed as it were around the other factors you do have in the model to kind of best match the behavior in the world. We see this statistically too, when we do a regression, which leaves out you know, some associations. Um, associational analysis is very different than causal analysis, but I'm, I make an analogy there in terms of the distribution of, of impacts associationally. And, um, and, you know, um, it's not quite true that we entirely leave out, we've cut off Procrustes legs entirely if we, if we leave it out of the factor for calibrating. It may be that, you know, 
he finds some ways to get around uh, despite it. But um, uh, but I think as modelers, we're, we're due, you know, to build some models that are stylized. And these can be very powerful. And in some quarters of the literature, they are welcomed. Uh, they are welcomed as points of, of advance in scientific thinking. If they're um, humble in their aspirations, characterized in a way that um, you know, speaks to their being theory building models and not theory explication models, and uh, they come to the subject with a, a sense of humility. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, um, that's all we have time for today. Um, and that's all we have time for in this tour of the topic of stylized models. I hope that's, hope that's been useful. Um, um, we will come back to this issue of disadvantage, um, trust, respect, stigma, et cetera, um, in another lecture, uh, which I'll be preparing on capturing uh, models for um, equity-seeking models, models that seek to grapple with challenges associated with health equity um, and, uh, and that often deal with societal, um, societal divides and, um, and uh, disparities of health uh, and equities and, and, uh, and, and health uh, that challenge our health system. We'll come back to that. Um, and stylized models play an important role there as well. Um, anyway, that's all for today. Ho hopefully that's a useful uh, understanding. And uh, I will open it up for office hours. <laughs>